scroll down to my yellow glitchless tasks, and I think because that task never saved, we should just be able to keep going with a task showing of Pokemon yellow glitchless. So this one here is a little bit older. It's one of my oldest tasks that's still published. So it doesn't have a fix yet to do the options in game. We are still doing it before the start of the run. But if we were to fix that, we would do it like the no safe corruption run and do it once we've entered the game. Hey, Illy. Thank you guys for staying up with the Tycoon 83 Pokemon Gen 1 task block, showing off all the main RTA speedruns of Pokemon Gen 1, all the main categories as tasses. And you can see here, this one again is a bit old because it gets that big long circle screen wipe as it goes into the oak fight. If we were doing that trick I mentioned in No Safe Corruption, we would get this double screen wipe that's 30 frames faster. Uh, and the way to get it is it involves writing data into the rival name and then deleting it while we are setting the rival name to A. Because the sixth character of the rival name happens to be like a, just, just a, coincidentally a buffer area of memory that is accidentally read when it's checking the level of the Pokemon in that battle. to figure out, hey, is this like a super scary battle or is it a super easy battle? And then we can change the intensity of the screen wipe animation based on the levels of the Pokemon. But th that animation never worked. It didn't work in Gen 1 uh, in certain places like that. And it didn't work in Gen 2 like at all. <laughs> it just completely bugged in Gen 2. But now we have the rival fight. And... In the no save corruption tasks, we needed to win the rival fight in three turns. However, in Pokemon Yellow Glitchless, we can lose the rival fight and intentionally Gen 1 miss Growl twice while getting Tackle Crit twice from the Eevee for a two turn, very fast death. Another cool fun fact about a potential rewrite that may happen someday of Pokemon Yellow Glitchless is that you can delay setting options not just to into the game, but all the way past that rival fight, and the tackle animation used by the Eevee is actually slightly faster if you do that. Because not only can you um not only can you get through all the text at the fastest speed by holding a button during the text, with the animations on instead of off, the default on is actually faster for the move tackle, and Growl doesn't have an animation if it fails. So you actually get a faster fight by pushing back that animation uh, change and like the whole option set after the rival fight. But that's another thing to look at in the next revision of this task. More YOLO grass, very, very cool from the TAS. And we are almost back to our usual Professor Oak parcel delivery. This is the, the fourth parcel we've delivered to Oak in the last three and a half hours. Any crazy donations happening there? Uh, well, yes, we do have a $66 donation from Audrey Azera, who says, "Since I forgot last time, here's some dollar to uh, here's some dollar to reach 4K to the doggo incentive." Sweet. Thank you, Audrey. I'm doing great, Flarp Freak. How are you? I'm I'm enjoying this 
amazing night of all the Pokemon Gen 1 tasks exhibitioning. So now we're we're in uh, red blue. We had to go to Route 22 to get Nidoran. We don't have to do that in yellow. Yellow Nidoran is much higher level. It's level six and it's available on Route 2. Jerry is not showing up on screen yet. There's a donation incentive if you would like to donate to Task Giving uh, to get Jerry on stream. Uh, I I don't know where we're at on that incentive, but I think that Audrey got us a bit closer with that $66. Uh, yes, as I refresh here, I believe we are $83 toward the $200 goal. So if you want to see some fresh doggo, uh, be sure to get those in, uh, donations in toward that incentive. And now we are through the old man Rattata Pokeball cutscene, and we can catch our Nidoran. Now, we don't have to save and quit to manipulate the stats like you would do in RTA. Like I said back over on the blue glitchless tasks, we can simply know where our RNG is at from the start of the console being powered on and do some slight walking and A presses and stopping and, and starting our walk again. And that gets us a perfect Nidoran. Except that in uh, TAS, actually, I didn't mention this back in the blue glitchless TAS, but in both the blue and the yellow glitchless TASs that we're showing today, the Nidorans have bad defense because we actually use that low defense to get them into red bar more easily, uh, especially with moves like uh, Quick Attack being a normal type and therefore using the attack stat. Now, slight pause there. We are going to manipulate... <gasps> The Pidgeotto in the forest! It showed up in NSC, but it's also showing up. Is it going to kill us again? That's a lot of damage from Pikachu. Maybe we can maybe we can survive this time. That's... Oh, man, we're getting close. Oh, the Pidgeotto connected. P Pikachu is down. Come on. Come on, level 6 Nido. You can You can beat him with Tackle. You can do it. Um, oh no, we're 1 HP. We did it. <laughs> all right, I played it up a bit there, but uh, that's all planned. <laughs> uh, Pidgeotto is a 1 in 100 encounter in the forest. It gets you a crap ton of experience. It's really useful. And the trainer you would have to fight to get the same amount of experience takes a lot longer than just using Pikachu to deal most of the damage and then letting Pikachu die so that all the experience goes on to Nidoran. It also is useful for getting all that damage taken in one hit so that we don't have to repeatedly take tackles uh, from other Pokemon. We do get one tackle there from the Caterpie to stay in a lower red bar, but uh, we are, we're just blazing through these battles. Now we have, we have our Nidoran. It has Horn Attack. It's level 8 instead of level 6 because of fighting that Pidgeotto. The Metapod does take uh, three turns here with some carefully timed Horn Attack crits and tackles. But another thing that's uh, going to be really, really precise about the yellow run and, and several of these fights is we're going to be encountering... Um, we're, well, for one, we're encountering this Pidgey here because we're in Red Bar and we need a Flyer. But in the battles, we're using moves in specific orders to make sure that Pokemon never go into Red Bar on the opposing team or Yellow Bar. We try to, we try to make sure that their color of the HP bar changes as few times as possible because if the color changes it causes a five frame delay while it changes the palettes the uh pokemon yellow color engine was kind of hacked onto the red blue engine so it it's not quite as efficient as it could be so like right there we're going from green to orange it's really difficult to tell because the game is running at 60 frames per second but Five frames are lost when it does that transition from the initial green color spawning into the game and the orange color. 
or, or, or yellow color. And then when it goes to the red color, it would also lose five frames. Now, also, you as the player, if you enter a battle in red bar, that is five frames slower than entering in green bar because it actually it loads the battle palettes with, with the green colors and then transitions it to whatever color you have from based on your HP. So there's all sorts of routing involved in this run, not just with, uh, like in red blue, we're going to do this move and then that move to make sure we don't have to like switch moves as many times. We're, we're also now having to worry about, well, if we switch moves, but then we're going to have this color lag thing. Diglett, five damage, keeping us in low red bar. This is one of my favorite uh, fights in the yellow speed run. We are able to kill the sand shrew just barely in two hits. Uh, and sand shrew has to gen one miss us because if we got hit at all from sand shrew, we would die. So it's a. 139 horn attack, not crit, and then a gen 1 miss, which is a 1 in 256, and then a 1 in 39 critical to kill the Sandrew. Now on Geodude here, this is a thing that you can do in RTA, but it's pretty rare. Uh, you, you have a chance to get a 1 in 39 double kick on the first turn of the kick, and then you can actually 3 shake the Geodude. And now on the Onyx, we go straight into double kicking, and we get bite intentionally from the Onyx, and we can crit the double kick. We hit him in just the right way so that he never goes into red bar. So we, we did lose the 5 frames from his HP going into the yellow bar, but his HP never went into the red bar. We do need to battle the the trainer before Brock just to get double kick for the Brock trainers. That's still a thing in the task, and that's one of the big differences between the yellow and the blue tasks still, is that there's no way to get through Brock without Squirtle, uh, except to get some other Pokemon from the wild, and so we need double kick from Nidoran to get that. And it's level 12, so we, we do have a bunch of grinding still in the yellow run that the blue run does not have to do. So here, where in the blue run, we would have slightly different experience because of the Onyx fight. In the yellow run, we have slightly different experience because of fighting the Pidgeotto instead of the first bug catcher. But the bo in both cases, those different experience bonds are very marginal, and they only matter in a very small circumstance near the end of the route. Now here, we leveled out of red bar. This is because there is not a great way to handle all of the variables involved to stay in a lower red bar. Like, if we were to take damage from the Caterpie, we wouldn't be able to stay in red bar as long because we'd have to take less damage before we level up. And if we take damage from the Rattata, well, now we can get a quick attack so we don't lose a turn. And then we take eight damage so we're at one instead of taking like a five damage crit from the Caterpie. Yeah, it's kind of annoying that we have to level out a red bar, but, like, the HP just doesn't work out otherwise. So on the red run, we would have to be critting these uh, Pokemon because... And actually, here, you wouldn't even, like, crit the Kakuna in one shot. We have to two-turn the Kakuna in red-blue. Because we're so much lower level. But here we're level 15. And we can actually even non-crit horn attack that Caterpie. Just barely. 
One in 39 chance. And now here, we don't hit level 16 because of that different experience from fighting the Pidgeotto. It's no big deal, though, because as Tass, we actually don't mind being Nidoh longer because his cry is shorter than Nidorino's. Can't quite kill that Metapod, though, without having the Nidorino evolution, so. Slight time loss from not being able to get to Nidorino as quickly. And now on to Mount Moon. We're going to have a deep stretch of encounter manipulating here. So just like Red Blue, we avoid the Water Gun TM. We don't need it at all in yellow because Nidoran has double kick in yellow, where red blue can't even learn, it can't even learn double kick. Even if it needed it for, for Onyx, it couldn't learn it because it gets poison sting in red blue. Still need that moonstone though, because we want Nido King. So many follows coming through in the chat right now. Appreciate all the following and all the, the donating happening going on. Did we get a $120 donation? Uh, well, yes, we did. Uh, Jerry uh, says, Woof, which I believe translates to, Who are you talking to, Master? That puts us over the donation goal for the Jerry incentive. Let's see some doggo. All right, I will. I will. Uh, I'll go grab Doggo while we get to uh, Nugget Bridge. All uh, right. Thank you, Jerry. There is. There's a great example of the keeping the HP in Green Bar. There, we used the tackle first on Grimer and then switched back to Horn attacking for turn two, so that we didn't hit it into the lower HP bar colors ever. And then we go uh, into the next two, the Voltorb and the Coughing, and the with the cursor in the right spot again for. Uh, horn attack but then here because the battle ends with using tackle we actually don't want to do the tackle first because we have to go down to tackle and then go back losing 14 frames versus the five frames of the color lag so just super super intricate frame counting involved with the color lag versus switching around the different moves And here we have the Team Rocket fight. Getting that critical hit on the Meowth to get a one shake double kick. A lot faster than two shakes with no crits. And now Horn Attack not critting to keep it in green bar and then critting on the second turn again avoiding color lag with our move choices actually hold on a sec here
Here we go. Jerry, say hi to stream. Oh, look at him! Yeah! You see the Pokémon? We gotta go kill Misty, Jerry. You like that? You like killing Misty? Ah, oh, Jerry's tired. Okay. Excellent. Way to go, chat. Thank you all so much for your donations. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so for those who have not been uh, sticking around since the beginning of the night, I guess we could re-explain, keep everyone on the same page. This is a tool-assisted speedrun live from a real GameCube and Game Boy player setup. So there is a... Game Boy Advance effectively strapped to the bottom of a GameCube, and the GameCube is telling the Game Boy Advance when an input is happening based on a script from an SD card. So the, the, the script is all written in BizHawk. We then export the inputs to a file, and that goes to uh, talk to, from the GameCube, the Game Boy Advance, the Game Boy Player attachment for the GameCube. So all these exact same inputs could happen on a real Game Boy Advance. Uh, the Game Boy Player attachment for the GameCube being very similar to a Game Boy Advance. And that's through the action replay. Um, the the action replay just lets you load homebrew like Swiss, uh, and mm -hmm. then Swiss is like a another homebrew loader that's more versatile than the action replay. <laughs> So then from Swiss, I load up a whole array of Game Boy interface instances. Game Boy interface is actually like the key to the whole pipeline that lets us do the um, sending the inputs from the SD card to the Game Boy Advance. Very cool. Yeah, I just got a consoleized GBA recently, so uh, uh, yeah. it seemed to be easier than finding a Game Boy player for the GameCube. <laughs> yeah, so like there's a lot of uh, competing like technology in that arena because... The Game Boy Advance is awesome, but the one mm -hmm. that we use for the TaskBot pipeline, and it's very common in the speedrunning community in general, is the Game Boy Player, and then using Game Boy Interface to uh, effectively TaskBot. The same way that TaskBot holds like a little microcontroller, the GameCube gets to act as the microcontroller. <laughs> very cool. And through all of that, we uh, we beat Misty. A little bit slower than we could. Um, this is another potential optimization for the future of the yellow run. Is um, I was doing a little bit slower strats when I found that Misty fight. And it should be entirely possible with uh, more careful searches to find more Gen 1 misses in that fight and make the fight a little bit faster. So here again, we're seeing the power of having Bubble Beam so early, doing Misty before the Nugget Bridge really opens up the speed of the Nugget Bridge. But these fights are a little bit different because we have an Eevee here, so we do have to double kick the Eevee. And at level 21, we can just barely get a single shake Eevee double kick crit. The TaskBot uses the Task TM32, made by, I believe, Onosaurus, and that is available for purchase, actually. There are, there are several Task TM32s available, available for purchase. The Task, uh, it can Gen 1 miss, it does it occasionally intentionally, and it never does it if it doesn't want to. So onto the second trainer of Nugget Bridge, we're going to continue using Bubble Beam judiciously.
don't quite have Thrash yet. And in typical Pokemon Yellow speedruns, we would rush getting Thrash at level 23 on the third trainer on Nugget Bridge by candying. But because we fought Misty already, we don't need to really rush it at all. We can just naturally get it when we get to Thrash. And uh, also, like I was talking about in the Red Blue run, you don't even really want to use Thrash unless there's a full four Pokemon or more in the opposing trainer's party. Uh, Bubble Beams will be perfectly fine otherwise. And uh, avoid having to use that wind-up animation. Practical Task and does encounter manipulation cost frames? It doesn't have to. You can walk different paths just to cause different numbers of cycles to run in each frame. The Game Boy, uh, while being deterministic, which is really, really useful for tasking and, and task verification, uh, does not always have the same number of cycles in a frame. Um, and there's like, there's like a whole bunch of really complex reasoning behind that, but you can effectively like change the number of cycles to a point when the RNG is calculated by walking different paths. Um, but if that doesn't work for whatever reason, if you can't get enough variance out of the different walk paths, you can also use A presses to cause two frame delays in the overworld. And uh, that will also significantly change the RNG. And if that fails, you can stop walking for two or more frames. Uh, like, periods of two frames. And you can combine all of those effects, right? So you, you can generate a lot of variants very quickly because you can combine the different paths, the A presses, and the not walking at all. And you can make it virtually invisible to generate encounter manipulations. There is one kind of visible one in, in this run uh, that I w wish to replace at some point. The, the Pidgeotto manip in the forest that we do in this run is pretty slow because it was found by hand. Uh, it's like a 50 frame wait and that could be cleaned up. The, this is the first TAS, like I said, that was uh, published on TAS videos. And this actually, the one you're watching isn't even the published one because this is so old of a, a run that the published one didn't play back on console originally and, it, and this had to be rewritten to play back on console and the rewrite was like a couple frames slower than the original one so we need to go back and do a whole rewrite of this run with the newer things that i've been mentioning like the in-game options instead of the before the game menu options delaying the options until after the first battle to get the animations on tackle animation which is faster than the animations off tackle animation um, writing characters into the rival name to change the animation in that Pikachu catching cutscene. Uh, yeah, I could, I, I could break poker. Um, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I don't really find poker fun. I'm not really a gambling person. Uh, it's uh, fascinating that there's still all this like cutting edge research happening on you know these decades old consoles yeah um it's it's really a function of like if you go past the game boy it gets really difficult to make an emulator this accurate to do the stuff like this like like i said earlier we are having to we're having to precisely count the number of cpu cycles that have passed uh at every single rng roll for the entire game which is like billions and billions of CPU cycles. And so the emulator has to emulate all of that CPU activity to the, to the, to the clock cycle perfectly. Um, that's not really done ever outside of Gambate and a little bit in GP Hawk, the, uh, the other emulator for the Game Boy. Yeah, we have some botting tools to find Minips automatically now that have been made um, w both while I was making this task and since. Um, and actually, a, a guy, Mr. Wint, I, I'm not showing this task now because it's kind of uh, risky to show a three-hour long task, but Mr. Wint made a crystal glitchless task that syncs on my crystal cartridge. And that's a two-hour, 48-minute, and 36-long task. And the entire task is botted. Like, every fight Every uh, grass m encounter manipulation, everything was found by a robot.
Yeah, it's uh, it's from a Japanese word, ganbate. I don't, I don't know what that means because I don't speak Japanese. I have a degree in linguistics, but that doesn't mean I know languages. It means I know concept about how language works. <laughs> So, uh, Gambate being like Game Bate, but I. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so, Audrey, the, the RNG itself isn't actually like the whole CPU cycle count. It's like a. It's just this uh, thing tracking from the divider, which is. It's looping. It's like a two byte uh, hardware register. Oh, yeah, it means do your best in chat. That's what it is. Fun fact, in Bill's house in Red Blue, you have to manually go back to use the PC, but in yellow, it, it forces you back after a certain point. CPP has the full explanation for the super technical minded in the chat about how the RNG uh, ticks in the game. And now we get to get the dig TM, which we will use in yellow um, because uh, quite usefully in yellow, you get Charmander for free. It actually is faster to get Charmander from the trainer than to get an encounter. Not even talking about like catching encounter, it's faster to, get to pick up the Charmander than to get an encounter. So it's not even a question about whether you would do anything else. You just you just get Charmander. <laughs> Instead of uh, in Red Blue, we went and got a Sand Shrew for our uh, cut friend. And I, I may have missed this in the previous task explanation, but let's see if it's again here. Yes, yeah, so we pick up the full restore buffered underground. You see this in some of the RTA runs, but definitely need to see it in the tasks because we need to fill up our bag. And we use basically like the transition of going from the building to the underground to override some audio stuff and make it so that the jingle never plays when you pick up item. Thrashing the Pidgeys. We are uh, going into the rival fight on the S-San. And we get to thrash it again. Four Pokemon just like the blue fight, but with a little bit of a different lineup here. The thrashes need to crit in different places. Because there's no Pidgeotto in, in uh, Spiro in this lineup. But the Sandshrew, we do need to crit that guy. And then Eevee does not need a crit, just barely to be taken out. And 
now we get cut. And all this with no instant text, too. A very big difference between what happened in the blue tasks and also with the red bar not cutting out the intro cries of battles. We've been in red bar to get rid of the death cries in battles, but not the cries of Pokemon at the beginning of battles when they, when they enter. So we're losing a lot of time in the yellow task compared to the blue task, both not having gotten the instant text and from having a weaker version of red bar. And now we are going to go on to the SSN and I'm going to grab some water because I've been walking for almost three hours. Okay, like in the blue task, we manipulated the position of the cans back from when we exited the SSN, and now we are to Surge. But Surge is a very different lineup in yellow than in red-blue, so here... We're going to, to thrash his only Raichu. Growl fails being super fast. One of the fastest moves that the Raichu could use on us. And now we have Thunderbolt. This is going to be just like Red Blue going back to Cerulean. Except, like I said earlier, we're not going to be able to dig out of the fan club where we get the bike voucher. We're going to walk back to Diglett's cave to use Dig. There's manipulating the girl to go down, so we have a clear path to walk to the bottom and buffer, talking to the shady bike salesman. And now, swapping up our bicycle, teaching Thunderbolt. Exactly, Wolfazard. So by playing this on a actual console, we are calling it a console verified speedrun. And as I was mentioning earlier with the development of Gambate, the Game Boy Player and the, the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color libraries have become very, very uh, efficient to write console verifiable tasks for. Um, kind of. The Game Boy interface prevents RTA speedrunners from doing left plus right 
or up plus down inputs, where like you'd have a broken controller and and could press both the up and down D-pad buttons at the same time. Um, you, you just can't do that with Game Boy Interface or the original Game Boy Player Disc. Um, you could do it with like a hard modded actual Game Boy Advance. Um, what's the um, you can do it in an emulator, of course. You can press both the left and the right button at the same time. So what happens if you try to play one of those speedruns that you created in an emulator back on the console? Game Boy Interface does allow passes that are being played back from a script to press left and right at the same time. So I don't think there are any inputs that you can do in an emulator that you can't do on a console for Game Boy. And coming up here is going to be one of the most infamous points of the run for the development of emulator accuracy. Uh, when we passed that hiker there, that was the point where Pokemon Yellow originally desynced and glitchless. Um, and we had to fix that desync. We had to figure out what actually happened. There was an extra frame difference um, in Pokemon Yellow at that point. And by identifying the cause of that desync, we were able to narrow down the last emulator inaccuracies for Pokemon. And then once all of Pokemon's accuracy was solved, especially with getting the RTC right for Gen 2, when we did Mr. Wins glitchless tasks, then with, with all of uh, Pokemon covered, it became a little bit less complicated to extend that accuracy to other games. Oh yeah, um, Fractal Pass. If we had some really uh, crazy programmers, we could almost certainly create uh, folding at home type, like uh, manipping at home, and create the uh, the most optimal Pokemon Yellow speedrun possible. Um, do I do I think that would be a good work, use of my time? Maybe not. <laughs> or or the world's energy resources. Could be a good uh, like learning experiment though to learn how to make distributed um, botting tools like that. But it's also kind of I don't know how it distributable it would be because you kind of have to like know what's been searched for already for these kinds of things and. You can't really do that distributed. Yeah, we, we need manipping at home, right? That is a thing, Galveld. Crowd controlled Pokemon are a thing. You can see here we do not have the insane self-destruct fight. It's actually slower than using Ball Beam on the Geodudes and Gravelers. You just don't have any Bubble Beam PP left in Red Blue because you start out at a lower level and you don't get thrash as quickly. So in the yellow run we can a little bit more tightly control what we choose to use Bubble Beam on versus what we choose to thrash. I do like Mr. Mr. Wint's way of botting it. Like that's one of my goals with this project is to have uh, a botting system like Mr. Wint's to just uh, click a button and generate tasses of yellow and blue and uh, and such. Some weird biking at the end of Rock Tunnel. There, that is encounter manipulation, and then. Moving on here to the gambler fight. Yeah. 
J just so you guys, to, to make it more clear also, every one of the frames in the tasks that I'm showing tonight was manually looked at. So like, probably tens of people at this point have contributed to the inputs that are involved in the red any percent ta task. And between botting and hand uh, checking those inputs, um, red's been heavily optimized. And then blue with gift backs, I'm sure was botted and hand looked at. And then also both blue and yellow NSC had combinations of botting and hand tassing, or where like our encounter manipulations were botted and battles were found by hand. And uh, then yellow here. Um, had no botting. This this one this was, all, was all found by hand. So there's like 800,000 frames that were manually clicked through. And, and that's like just the final frames. So yeah, every one of those frames was looked at multiple times from different angles too. How does TAS help here? I think you were talking about that while we were un in the underground. Um, there is some precision to things like getting on the bike and you're gonna see in all of the menuing up the shops here, there's some things called double input that I will talk about and I should, probably should have even talked about it more in the blue run, but it's, it's useful in yellow just as in blue. Um, when you scroll down through menus, in Pokemon, you can press left and right as you go down, and it will reapply the down button a frame earlier. Practical test. I don't know if you were here earlier while we were doing the, um, read any percent one but that that one was fun because there's um that one's being looked at to the to the cycle now it's, it's actually being competed on timing by the cycle because the timing by the frame has um not been um like accounting for all of the complexity now of the optimization in it Yeah. <laughs> so here's where you're going to see that double input on the way down, pressing left and right at specific points. And yes, CPP's here. Casual Poke Player in the chat just recently found an improvement to run at 80%. One of the much, much prized things to find in Pokemon passing. Uh, he found a point where you can reset earlier than was previously known by doing a checksum collision. Um, I know yellow had on the order of like 2 million between the two attempts, so roughly like 4 million hand read records between blue and yellow. For an end product of around 600,000 frames. To be, to be fair, though, with so much complexity, there is a slightly less optimized state in some of these glitchless um, events. There is a lot more work that could be done. Due to the, the length and complexity. But now, uh, here in yellow, we are just drilling the crap out of the rival, where in the uh, red-blue task, we used thrash quite judiciously. And I don't even want to know how many re-records Wint did while doing Crystal Glitchless. Uh, only to whatever extent you can call Tass's records. It's not quite records in the same way, because it's really the um. So 
It's for the inputs that hold the record. There's nothing unique about what I did. Anybody could go out and find an improvement. But you can see some of the same strats we did here from the blue run, having to Thunderbolt crit the Ghastlies. And now we're going to, just like we did in Red Blue, we're going to take the heal pad, but we're not going to get Red Bar back as quickly. Um, like we said earlier in this run, the Red Bar is not as powerful as it is in Red Blue and Yellow. So we don't need to go through any sort of crazy stuff to get it back. We're just going to get it back when it's convenient. And now we have defeated all the channelers, and we can move on to Pokedolling Marowax Ghost. But slightly different from Red Blue, there are not three Rocket Trainers. They replaced them with Jesse and James. So we get our classic Jesse and James fight. I think I was able to get it through. Those looking for that link from casual poke players were at any percent submission. Um, but back to the yellow run, we did get through the Jesse and James fight by using our new horn drill. And now, like I was talking about, because we don't need to get red bar back as quickly from losing it from the heel pad, we can actually use the Celadon Center as setting a waypoint. And another really cool thing about Pokemon Yellow, you can do this in RTA even, uh, and I, I actually discovered it while doing tassing. You can do the left-right alternating double input strategy to make down happen faster in fly menus. So if you hold down to get to different cities while flying and spam left-right uh, at very specific intervals, it will actually go faster to the different cities by one frame per city. And sadly, we have to run from some by Relaxo.
Now, a uh, fun yellow thing. We are not cutting the bushes on the way to the safari zone because cutting the bushes in red-blue is faster than in yellow. And now, while we enter the safari zone here, we walk straight up to be seen by the safari zone attendant. If you were to turn at first and then walk to him, it would cause a two-frame delay. Uh, the, anytime you, the first time you turn on a map, it's a two-frame delay. It's called the turn frame, we like to call it. And that can be avoided by walking into the guy's vision and having him force walk you to him. And now, a whole bunch of encounter manipulations here in the Safari Zone to avoid badness. Don't want those Safari Zone encounters. And now we can get the gold teeth. We will be able to trade in later for strength and surf. And amazingly, we get to surf below the one hour mark in the yellow glitchless tasks. I didn't talk too much about the timing of the blue tasks. The current red blue glitchless world record in human runs is an hour and 45 minutes approximately. The red-blue glitchless task is an hour at 29 minutes and 35 seconds. And that is not accounting for uh, some differences in the timing methods between TAS and RTA. So it's actually even more different than that. It's, it's close to 16 minutes faster. Yes, you can dig out of the safari zone. You, if you leave the guy's house after getting surf, you can dig out and be back in Celadon and then fly to Koga, and now we are thrashing Koga. Dang, we're up to 739 people watching. Thank you to all the people coming in to watch at this odd hour, at least at my time. I don't know what neck of the, of, of the woods might be at a different time. I'm pretty sure you can dig out of the safari zone at any time. As long as you're not, like, indoors inside the safari zone. But now, finally, on this uh, second juggler, we have an opportunity to get our red bar back relatively quickly. So we thrash the first drowsy, crit it, and then on uh, the hypno, we will thrash, non-crit, back to that HP bar coloring stuff I was talking about. We don't crit the first turn. We specifically crit on the second turn after taking the confusion hit. So that the HP bar of Hypno never changes from green, and we never lose five frames to a color change. And we're back in red bar. Getting that sleep powder miss. Which we need because we, we do need one X item set up here to be able to outspeed the Venom off. Again, manipulating our bag closely so that we do not have space for Koga's TM. 
getting a full 20 items by buying extras of items like the Polka Doll and TM7 Horn Drill. Whereas RTA would make extra space for X items. And just like in Red Blue, we're going to rush the mansion right after Koga. Taking the opportunity to make use of our ether that drops a slot so that we can fill it back with the secret key in the mansion. And our cursor is at the bottom of our menu from teaching HM3 and 4. That's going to be quite useful. <sighs> Apologies to the stream. It is quite late for me, but I want to crank this out. I want to get there. Only half an hour left of the Mega Pokemon Gen 1 block. Thanks, man. Don't forget, guys, you can donate! This is all being done for charity for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Taskgiving.org Yeah. The, the RTA runs can do the same sort of craziness one-shotting everything. They just need an extra turn of setup with X accuracy to do so. Uh, a cool point also I'll make about the glitchless tasks is a lot of the routing of them was adapted from a task of Pokemon Red Blue glitchless that was done uh, back in like 2000. I want to say it's like 2006, 2007, really old, really long time ago, and it was very, very uh, advanced for its time. It actually had a lot of the strategies we still would use even in a task today. The main difference being um, they did not allow the use of things like instant text and the polka doll glitch uh, in, Mar in Lavender Tower, uh, Marowax goes. But now that we dug out of the mansion, we are back in Celadon, and it's easy to bike to Erica. Especially now that we have ice. Blizzard helps out great on Execute. We had to drill it back in the red-blue run, but getting an ice move in the yellow run is uh, a little bit more useful for some of these fights. Yeah, Whimsy Health, it doesn't, like, open anything else up in the game. Like, a lot of the times when we call something a glitch in Pokemon, we are talking about, like, memory manipulation type stuff, where you're, like, either doing item underflow, or party underflow, or trainer fly, those kinds of things, where you're like taking an area of memory that is being used in two different ways, and using it one way to influence the other way that it's not supposed to be happening at the same time. The code for Polka Doll only exists in like one way. It, it changes the victory flag of a battle. And as long as you get a victory flag from that battle, you're good.
So like it doesn't it doesn't corrupt the victory flag. It doesn't make it so that you can then write any code you want and go to the Hall of Fame with the victory flag. It just says you won the battle. You don't need the self scope. But there is, as Bob Chow mentioned, an alternate category that allows... Well, not allows. <laughs> it bans the use of the polka doll at that point so that you can experience that little extra bit of the story under the game corner. And now we get the one part of yellow that's faster than red-blue. Plain questions. Yeah, I actually wanted to call it Japan Rule Set Glitchless when we were talking about, like, debating over how to name it, but I was in the minority on that one. Getting close to the end of the blink questions. Will Tass answer one wrong? No. Tass, Tass does not answer blink questions wrong. Hits every button exactly at the right cycle of every frame. thing about Blaine and Tass is that you can drill these Pokemon. So, <laughs> we were talking about 37 versus a 50. There's 37 versus a 54. <laughs> no setup needed. Or if there, if there was setup, it's just an X speed. Yeah, T Tass is basically Gandalf, okay guys? I like that, X1. Who's hyped for Lord of the Rings 4K in two days? Whimsy, it is like super rare for Game Boy Tass as a PC. Gaia check, the, the RNG is the same every run, so it's deterministic from when the game console powers on, and we have, we have pre-scripted a series of inputs that will get the RNG that we want. That is the effect of the Pokemon glitchless tasks, it's just a giant 360,000 frame long piano player roll of inputs that are on an SD card and a GameCube sends to a Game Boy player. Thanks to the work of Extremes. On Game Boy interface. Similar stuff here in Sylph so far with the going straight for Arbok, but we're gonna get a little bit different now because we have a Jesse and James fight instead of a rocket after Sylph rival. I think people in general know more about AI than like electromagnetic determinism of, of old consoles, so I think people's default to that. Yeah, 
Atas is a really, really smart human making a really, really dumb scroll that gets fed into a, 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 a microcontroller. A really cool strat here, using the opportunity on Ninetales to Elixir, so that we get hit by uh, an Ember from Ninetales to get to 1 HP. You could make a menu in the overworld, just like open up the menu using Elixir, or you could Elixir during battle and use that as our opportunity to take damage and stay in red bar. Yes, we, we need to have the a class in every high school on the the deterministic theory of electromagnetism in old game consoles. That's what our children need to be learning about. You can see here just slightly different sequences of inputs and uh, using use of uh, Blizzard in that one point on Weezing to get a one-hit kill without wasting our precious horn drill PP. Thunderbolt crit on Nidorino. That's actually one of the most difficult ranges in this task, is that Thunderbolt crit. And then we have the Thunderbolt crit Persian. That's actually easier than the one on the Nidoran, because even Nidorino is so OP. And again, Blizzard or Rhyhorn. Oh yeah, I don't I don't mean that, Audrey. I just mean the fact that like electromagnetically this the state at the beginning of the console being on, it's always the same. So we can work from there and know where everything is. But I don't think we need to linger on that much more. We can get back to the, uh, the biking to the Saffron City. Because we're going to go to Sabrina! which is a completely different fight in yellow from the red-blue fight. In the red-blue fight, we use it to manipulate red bar actually all the way to the end of the game. Sabrina here is considerably easier. You can set up an X speed on Abra, manipulate its flash to fail to make it a little bit faster, and then immediately horn drill it. And we can drill everything on this fight because we are going to be able to refill our Pokemon power again very soon. And all of these Pokemon have extremely high specials, so the rest of our move pool right now is pretty weak for being these Pokemon.
And now that Sabrina's down, we are on to Giovanni. Dropped a slot again there. Just like in Red Blue, we do need to get Fissure. Here's Black Belt. Notoriously dangerous only in Red Blue. Not so notoriously dangerous in Yellow, but in Tass, we are in Red Bar. So it would be dangerous here if not for the fact that we can manipulate Thunderbolt Crits. Giovanni fight. Now this is a very different Giovanni fight than the blue red Tass. So in red blue Tass, glitchless, when you get the Giovanni it is just as free as it is in the RTA run. You just bubble beam everything or use drills and everything dies super easily. In yellow, Doug Trio out the gate can use Fissure and kill you instantly or he can use Earthquake and kill you instantly. Or he can use Dig and kill you next turn. But we can go in at Red Bar because Giovanni has the ability to use a guard spec on its Pokemon. So we manipulate Giovanni using the guard spec for a turn for us to set up X speed so that Fissure would no longer matter and our drills made me outspeed everything. And now we can easily tag out all of Giovanni's Pokemon with the Horn Drill including Rhydon, which, interestingly, is actually faster to kill with Horn Drill, even though it's not very effective, than using Blizzard, which is super effective. Yeah, I guess deterministic electromagnetism is, uh... Just, uh... Tautology, because electromagnetism is deterministic, usually. Until you get into, like, quantum tunneling. In any event, now we have Fissure, just like in Red Blue Tass. to the Viridian Rival. Now that we have Blizzard in yellow, unlike in red, we can Blizzard Sand Slash and execute we use fissure on actually because we need opportunities to use fissure pp and it's a good one then we fissure magneton 
even though it's super effective. It's a little bit faster to use the fissure there than any of the other options. We do need to set up an X speed, and we take the opportunity to do that on Nine Tails where we can take damage. And Fissure still works on Vaporeon, so everything is down on Viridian Rival, and then we go on to the Victory Road. And we can manipulate away all the encounters, so we'll not get any encounters on Victory Road. Which is fun, because in Yellow's current state, it is possible to get Onyx encounters on Victory Road, because there's very high-level Onyxes. And like we were talking about in the Mansion, Repels do not repel away encounters that are higher level than the first Pokemon in your party. on the bicycle. At that point, in an RTA run, you would use a repel, but we don't need to use repels because we are task. And amazingly, yellow also has swag boulder. Swag boulder does exist in yellow. Yellow does have a little bit slower boulder pushing than red blue. But not too bad. We'll be in and out of here in just a couple minutes. We are getting close to 12 minutes away from the end of all of Pokemon Gen 1 Tast. All the main categories. Don't forget in the last two minutes here, guys, all the proceeds from the tassing and RTA speedrunning you're seeing this weekend are going to the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And we appreciate all of the watching and support in the chat from the many viewers. Again, one of my favorite menus here as you drop back down, using Strength and then using Elixir. You can du this is a, actually really uh, one of my favorite menus, period. Um, the yellow one where you get to double input down to a light elixir and then double input back the bike. That's so cool. I, I love the precision available with the double inputs and the tests. It's very difficult to repeatedly double input like that in an RTA setting. And there's our swag boulder. Uh, carbon dioxide actually um, 
Uninitialized RAM on device power on is not impossible to console verify. If you uh, have certain techniques, we did it for a Game Boy game that had that issue. There is there is a memory wiping cartridge that allows you to do that in the NES now, and I think there's also a way of doing it in the Game Boy. So we did that for Donkey Kong 94, and casual poke player was able to to, to uh, play back a task that has uninitialized RAM. Though you you were totally correct, you were you were on the on the correct route. That that is that is a problem that is in, that has been encountered in in tasking. But we have ways of doing tasks that are not from power on, so to speak. We we have ways of manipulating the power on state of the console. Getting close to being through Lorelei with our repeated horn drills again, sweeping the field. And we use a uh, fissure on Lapras here, so we'll have another drill available later in the run. And we do that last uh, so that we don't have to switch moves back and forth, right? So we, we're drilling a bunch, and then we fissure once. So we have one move switch that's a seven-frame delay. If we were to switch back to using Horn Drill, that would cause another seven-frame delay. So we just use the fissure the last turn to battle. Now we have the ability to Blizzard Onyx because we have that Blizzard picked up from the mansion. And hit Monchan. You making use of that instead of the Thunderbolt like the Red Blue Task did. And hit Mon Lee. Bruno at the 130 mark. Now on to Agatha. Now, in Red Blue, we were able to do Agatha without taking damage. That is not the case in Yellow. In Yellow, you do have to take some uh, some damage from Agatha's Gengar. So Agatha's Gengar, uh, the best move you can afford to take in Tass is Lick because you can manipulate the Lick and not paralyzing you. In, in an RTA run, you would be scared to see Lick because it could paralyze you, but we can manipulate it not doing that to uh, have time to set up our X speed, and then we can Fissure on turn two and kill the Gengar. Then on Golbat, we can use Blizzard to take that out, and now we have opportunity to Fissure again. And that's why, right here, why we used Fissure on the last turn of Lorelei is that we would have one Horn Drill PP left to take out the Arbok, and now we're back to Fissuring Gengar. Because that two swaps, that's the 14 frames swapping back and forth of the moves, is less uh, time than the number of frames that would take to show the uh, super effective text if we were to Fissure an Arbok. Now on to the Lance fight. It's going to happen very similarly to the Lance fight from Red Blue. Now that I don't have to use my controller more, I'm just going to show you guys one more time for the people who are coming here 
in the middle of the night from the Twitch front page or wherever. I'm just gonna show you guys quick here with a quick turnaround of the camera, the setup. So we have a GameCube and this controller port here is meaningless. I'm gonna take this guy out. Task will keep playing off of the SD card. And you're seeing that Pokemon Yellow cartridge with the SD card and the GameCube, the GameCube all lit up. That's coming through here to my OBS feed. You can see the Pokemon Yellow playing. Take a, yeah, well, CPP said that because you actually can, because there's like a buffered amount of inputs from the SD card. Ha, <laughs> thank you. The handsome man in charge, yes. And we are now on to the final battle. The champion battle! Very scary in RTA. Sand Slash's Earthquake. You need to be in not kill range from that, but really fun in task we can just yellow drill it. And it's not a yellow, because it's a TAS. And a very fun thing you can do in TAS as well is you can set up the X speed on Alakazam because you can manipulate Kinesis fail, and that but it failed text is always very useful for us. We need a task playing Pokemon to talk later. And uh, for those not in the scene, we have done tasks of the TI-83. Uh, we, we task programming a game in basic and then task playing the game that was programmed. It's a uh, bit of a fun one. Clone of the old Daleks DOS game for the TI-83. And that TI-83 calculator being my namesake for TI-83. Just finishing up the last couple bits of the battle here with it, with fissuring the Vaporeon. The champion having a Vaporeon because of our choice to lose the initial battle. If we had won the battle against Gary, that would be a Flareon that we chose to lose. And if therefore fissure is normally effective, better than the super effective would be against Flareon. So not just is the battle faster because of two turns to lose, it's faster because of the lineup necessary. Also with using nine tails to take quick attacks at different points in the game. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch all of the Pokemon speedrunning the last four hours. It has been one of my um, biggest goals to be able to do a big block of streaming of these tasks back to back. All of the Pokemon Gen 1 main categories, the any percent, the NSC, and glitchless categories. We saw from casual poke player Alyosha, Flinderax, and several other people. Mr. Wind, uh, many, many people, the work that was done on the Pokemon any percent run, uh, the red any percent run. Then we saw Gifx's Pokemon Blue, NSC, TAS, in 10-12. Then we saw three of my TASs, the Pokemon Blue Glitchless TAS in 129.35, the Pokemon Yellow NSC TAS, which is the current NSC TAS published on TAS videos in 947.09. And then, to cap it off, my favorite game, Pokemon Yellow, Tast Glitchless. This is my favorite Pokemon game, uh, Tast Glitchless. And showing off the differences in routing with the different Pokemon that the gym leaders have, 
and getting the Blizzard TM and all the different color lag strategies, the different strategies getting through the early game with things like that Pidgeotto Manip instead of the Pikachu Manip. Yeah, thank you for watching, Audrey. Thank you for watching everybody in the chat. Thank you, thank you, Whimsy. A lot of people, a lot of old friends. Vi, Vi was hyping me up. Some Vi Gray Tech hyping me up a lot on Twitter. Uh, thank you everybody for watching, and we should throw it back to break for the next runs. Mm -hmm.